Welcome to LinkedIn Heroes. Pretty excited today. I'm in Melbourne with Jules Lund. Jules has been about 15 years in the TV and entertainment space and founded uh, Tribe, which is uh, leading the social influence game at the moment. Jules, uh, welcome to LinkedIn Heroes. Good to be here, Nat. Very happy to, we look like we're about to present a sports show. <laughs> Can you give the viewers a bit about your background? Yeah, okay, so I'm a collector of life experience. I, I, I've never really studied anything, but I sort of lean into the darkness and, and wherever I have an interest, I, um, I, I sort of explore it and try to uh, educate myself to some sort of an output. So I uh, studied graphic design in the early days and then I started to backpack traveling, realized that TV presenting looked pretty fun because we're on, me and a friend were 19 and we were on Jerry Springer and then we we're on Ricky Lake, uh, who he won comment of the day and then um, uh, he won comment of the day on Sally Jesse Raphael. I proposed to a girl on that show, um, you name it. We had a ridiculous adventure. Rather than going to theme parks, we just did TV shows. And then from there, I sort of got into TV, combining presenting and the travel that I loved. And then from TV, I moved into radio. And so I hosted, well, I actually started in radio, but only for a short time. So I went back to radio for about five years. And it was only through radio that I started to fall in love with this two-way conversation that you could now have in social media. The thing I didn't like about radio was it was so visual and all my ideas were visual because I'd done graphic design and TV. And so I was able to express that in social media. And then I saw the power of um, building social tribes. I thought, um, why dig for gold when you can sell shovels? And so uh, rather than try to be a content creator, I wanted to um, create a platform for hundreds of thousands of other content creators to be able to express their passion and to be able to make some money. Um, and so that's why I created Tribe. So Tribe is a marketplace that connects brands with micro influencers, those that have between 3,000 and 100,000 followers on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. And um, yeah, we've been going for three years now. We've done about 10,000 campaigns. We've paid out about $10 million to everyday content creators. And, um, and we've got about 40,000 of those. We launched in the UK. We started here obviously in Melbourne um, and now we're moving uh, more broadly across the globe which is really exciting but challenging. Mm, awesome and I've been following your journey closely on social media and it's, uh, it is a big shift coming from the entertainment industry moving into uh, entrepreneurship I guess Yeah. and you must have encountered some challenges along the way. Maybe you could pick one to share with us that yeah. you have to overcome. Starting the company. That's the one, <laughs> that's the challenge. That was the stupidity of it. It's been, it's been the hardest I've ever worked because the company's been founded for three years, but I've been working on it for closer to four to five. And um, you know, it's a marketing tech company, but I've never studied marketing. I know nothing about tech and I've never run a company. And so I had to surround myself with smart people and um, and I suppose the biggest challenge was early on when I realized that even though I had a vision and I could tell the story and I could enroll people and raise money, I couldn't run the business. And so um, I hired a CEO, Anthony Sverskis, and uh, he and I, and um, a CK is our CTO, and, and Nick and a whole executive team and all the team underneath have built this company. Um, over the last three years. But the biggest challenge is just being able to identify my weaknesses. You know, that's one of my biggest strengths, knowing what my weaknesses are. And you know, everyone says you've got to work on your weaknesses, but in reality, you could spend a lifetime trying to work on your weaknesses. What you've got to do is identify your strengths and really work those to their utmost. And, um, and within that, there's enough things you have to work on that you don't have to turn down paths and go, you know, I've got to understand um, accounting and the legalities and I've got to understand technology. So I don't understand technology and we've got sort of 30 odd developers and that's okay as a founder. Um, so giving myself that permission. So I think that's been the hardest thing. But also I think that's been the benefit, not being embarrassed by not knowing things, you know, um, and acknowledging that you can't be everything and that's okay.
Mm. Well, that kind of leads me into the next question, which is, what's one of the key attributes that you would attribute to your success as an entrepreneur? Okay, well, is it, I mean, I've always wanted to get shit done. I've always been pretty um, proactive, uh, and I've always liked the hustle. Like, I've always liked trying to not go the direct route, trying to go around the edges. I've enjoyed that, and I've always been proud of that. I've always felt proud of being the underdog. I never worried that I wasn't, um, you know, that I wasn't part of a big business and all that. I've always seen the, the benefit of being um, scrappy and, um, and have agility. You know, all the way back down to the hustle of, you know, as a uh, 12 year old, we had, you know, we used to wash cars out the front of our house for $3 a car. Um, and, you know, there were times when there wasn't enough demand, so we would take mum's vacuum cleaner bag um, out and then just cover the neighbourhood's cars in dust <laughs> to increase that supply. <laughs> or better yet, when we were down at the golf course, um, we had a golden retriever, which we turned into a golf ball retriever, and so we would hide down in the creek, and then as soon as a ball hit the green, we would send the dog to go and grab the ball, and then about three holes later would sell that ball back to the golfers. Um, so things like that. Yeah, awesome. And what are you excited about in your business life at the moment for the future? Well, look, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty transparent with what I'm going through and, you know, that's one of the values of our company. Um, and I think it holds us in good stead, but I'll be brutally honest with, with how I'm going. I'm certainly not going to give you the sugar-coated. Um, what excites me is I'm actually excited about shaking off a bit of a funk that I've had for the last 12 months. So we've been raising some money and it's taken me into areas that I haven't felt innovative. I haven't expressed the things that make my heart sing, like being creative, um, working in product, telling people about the story and just feeling at the cutting edge of what we're doing. And so so, you know, when you're building technology, unlike an agency, because there's a lot of influencer marketing agencies, there's very few influencer marketing technology platforms that are pure and self-serve, and that just takes slower, you know, and it's it can be frustrating because I have the vision, like I had a vision three years ago for, and we haven't even got to that yet. So it's just, you've got to be sort of so patient. So um, what I'm excited about is having a bit of a break and allowing my, myself to, to have all these great ideas again that really make me feel excited and inspired about the future. I think that for me is really important. Um, but also we've got a huge opportunity next year to have one massive crack at it. And, um, and we, as I said, we've been building technology for three years. It's, it's built for scale. And yet, unless the whole thing can really scale, you can't sort of, it's like the mousetrap. You know, like if I put a ball in one end and the mouse trap, if it if it only goes halfway and then I have to go in and grab it, it only really works when it's fluid all the way through, and that takes a while. And so, you know, when the ball gets stuck, agencies just go, oh, I'll just grab the ball and put it there, quick. Whereas we go, don't touch the ball. We have to wait till it works. Yeah. And the benefit is after a while, when they put one ball from there to there as an agency, we have a thousand that go through in the same time. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're working towards, huge scale. Yes. And that's a real discipline. Yeah, and I have to ask, you mentioned Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Yeah. What, is, what does the future hold for influencer marketing on LinkedIn, do you think? Yeah, you're running out of money now. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna monetize these guys. Get out your wallets. Okay. So uh, I'll answer that question by giving you an idea of what my vision is. So we've built a marketplace on the content that you can get from influencers, not on their reach. Because the reality is they don't own their reach, right? And LinkedIn right now is giving you a ton of organic reach. Um, but the reality is they're not sharing your content with new users, they're sharing the platform with new users. And as soon as they hit saturation point, they dial that down and, and turn the paid component up, um, as we know. And, and Facebook did that, and then Instagram. So I built the most engaged Facebook brand page in the country when I was in, in radio. 
And um, it was a huge community, and that's where I realized, hang on, this thing, influencer marketing can work. But then overnight, they changed the algorithm and, and, and my organic reach dropped, and I realized I didn't own this audience. So I didn't build our marketplace on the reach you get from influencers, but the content. And so what we do is, what we're generating is, we're using influencers to generate stunning marketing grade collateral that can be used in billboards, display, and social advertising. Because influencer marketing is valuable to a point in terms of its word of mouth marketing at scale in organic reach, but it's not nearly as valuable as that actual image or that video that can be taken and, and put in um, really sophisticated, targeted, um, paid campaigns. Because, you know, Instagram, you've got 100,000 people from an influencer. It's a pretty blunt tool. You don't know who's there. You don't know how to target. You can't differentiate just with the girls versus the boys. You can't um, segment it. Whereas, obviously, if I take that piece of content that I know performs well and I put it in Instagram ads and I can say I want 20 to 25-year-old girls, you know, in Cronulla, interested in fashion and fitness on Instagram. That's a sharp tool. There's no wastage, but yet to be able to do that you need a lot of content so what we've built is a, a platform it's almost like a stock image library on demand using everyday content creators so we've generated over half a million beautiful pieces of content so we get 20,000 beautiful pieces of content every month right so there's about 250 grand a day that go through our platform now LinkedIn the content isn't as repurposable Mm -hmm. So if I was to just purely look at your influence and your content um, and, and reaching that audience, that takes care of the, um, the word of mouth marketing component. But what I want to be able to use LinkedIn for is when the content is stunning. So if it's going to be promoting a beautiful watch or it's going to be a, um, a Mont Blanc um, a pen or a diary or an event space or um, all sorts of things, I want that content to live on. And at the moment, the content creators in LinkedIn, they're not artists. They're bullshit artists, <laughs> most of them, but they're not all artistic. And so that, that value for me in the, in the lens that I look at this opportunity isn't as valuable. Yeah, okay, oh, I get it now, I completely understand. Because you're yeah, creating content on scale, yeah. which can be yeah. repurposed. Now that's not to say, like your videos, right, you could easily create you know, 90 second videos talking about a certain product in your style and, and, and giving advice there, and it could be paid for, right? No question. Um, then that brand would purchase that and put it as almost like a webisode series from their profile. There's value there, but there's not, it's not a hotbed. You would have to generate the marketplace, whereas Instagram, it was already happening and we're just jumping in front of that parade. So that's my long answer. Um, Jules, if you could be a superhero, who would you be and why? All right. Well, let's walk through them. Most of them are on the spectrum. So you've got Batman, who's got, you know, his parents were killed in front of him, so he's all fucked up. Um, Superman, he has to hide. You've got Tony Stark, who's definitely on the spectrum. Hulk has anger issues. Um, Thor, he doesn't know where he lives. Um, obviously can't be one of the girls. Um, who else have we got? Aquaman. Aquaman, don't know enough about him. Um, all right, Captain America. I'd be Captain America because he doesn't have to hide. He's just patriotic, so he just cares about people. He can walk around normally. He's built like a brick shit house, so he looks good. Like Superman's a horrible example. He was literally, his whole planet blew up. So he got sent here, not abandoned, but he's definitely displaced. Whereas Captain America is just a strong dude. Strong dude with good pecs. <laughs> Which, to be honest, if you were to look at me right now, you'd almost assume I got that. No, I don't. I got no pecs. In fact, it's the only thing I haven't fucking succeeded with in life. I've always wanted pecs. Maybe I'll get some implants. Awesome. Thanks for being on LinkedIn Heroes, Jules. No um, don't forget to go and follow Jules on LinkedIn and let us know what you think in the comments. We'll see you next time.
Hey, don't hit me up about SEM, SEO. Uh, I don't want anyone selling me on that in my inbox, please. <laughs>